I also understand you took over the uh, lead role of the stage play uh, The Phantom of the Opera uh, from Michael Crawford, uh, who really uh, took that role to another level, and then you brought your own spin to it. And I understand the director, Harold Prince, said that uh, you were selected because you displayed the most authority and elegance uh, during the auditioning. Uh, how was that for you? Well, again, uh, it was like I, I liked being singled out to do that part. Uh, I liked what it meant. Because I had seen it in London, I'd seen it in New York, I think I'd seen it in Los Angeles. And so I decided that I would like to pursue replacing Michael because I'd heard that he wanted or he wouldn't be averse to taking a vacation. And uh, so and my manager at the time, Healy Elkins, one of the classiest men I've ever met but he had been a big producer in New York. And he had worked with Hal Prince and some of the biggest names in New York. He knew the producer, a guy by the name of McIntosh, of what, what is this show we're talking about? Oh, Phantom of the Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he knew they, they were personal friends. They worked together, I suppose, or something. And uh, so he called him and said, How would you, what would you think if Robert Guillaume played that part? And he was repeating what he said on the phone. If Robert Guillaume played the Phantom, well, a big roar of laughter went up. And after the laughter died, he said, sure, we'll entertain that. So we put the phone down, didn't hear from them two or three months. I thought the idea was dead. They finally called one day and said, uh, hey, about uh, Robert Guillaume playing the Phantom of the Opera. I said, well, we finally found out, yes. And he, could he come in for an audition? So I went down for an audition, and I had been singing the main song for the Phantom, which is only, oh, you only had one song. And I had been singing it a third higher. And they said, no, you can't do that. They refused to entertain the possibility of singing, me singing it higher because I was a tenor, and part of it was too low for me. And they said, no, you'd have to sing it in the original key. I said, OK, OK. So I made my peace with that. And you'll have to go to New York. And uh, I was hoping that I'd get to do it in New York, because that had been my stomping ground, and people knew me. And so they said, uh, can you meet with Hal Prince? And my, it shook me to the core. I said, oh, God, Hal Prince. These are guys that I admired and cavelled over, you know, because they, they were Broadway. So they 
we went off to New York to have him audition me and then subsequently train me for two weeks. And he took it on and all the while telling me that he had liked my work as much of it as he'd seen while I was while I was before I came to television. And we worked, he he had me he had my throat raw. Uh, he finally we finished, and I went, and I didn't even know I had it or anything. I came back to L.A. after that two-week stint with him, and uh, I went back to my house, and I opened the door, and the maid She was so sad. She said, Robert, you got it. You got it. <laughs> and uh, so that's how I got it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, you and your wife Donna founded the Confetti, in a, Confetti Entertainment. Um, tell us what inspired you uh, to found that company. Well, I carried around this secret dream of making things better for young black kids. And uh, so somebody came to me one day with the idea of these children's books. And they had already put together about six or seven of them. And so I thought it was an opportunity to uh, put them together. And I had all these fancy notions all my life about what we could do, what I could do for people less fortunate than I. Like what? Hmm? Like what? What do you mean? Your ideas. You mean what were my ideas mm -hmm. in this direction? Oh, well. I always wanted to do a show in which black people could look at the show and not have to wince or be ashamed of something that I'd done. And I wanted to escape that at all cost. And in the case of Benson, I think, as you suggested, we accomplished that these books were another step in that direction. Because kids had could black kids could look at the fairy tales and see pictures of reflections of themselves. And they, it might hopefully give a sense that they do matter. So that's what that's where those books came from. Mm -hmm. um, you have um, you do have a lot of um, recordings that I noticed um, on iTunes, recordings of your own. Uh, classic songs from the Phantom of the Opera, um, other standards and whatnot. Um, were you planning to do any more with your, um, with the entertainment company? Are you going to utilize the book project under this, under this company or is that under uh, something? No, I think time caught up with me. Yeah. I uh, wanted to do I, see, I got into this business because I wanted to sing. 
And it quickly became clear to me that my singing, while it may have pleased me and 12 or 13 other people, it was never going to be what I envisioned. So I abandoned singing as an idea to move myself up, if you will. And that's when I decided I'd do comedy, comedy acting. Well, tell us um, about uh, the book project you have coming up. Oh, that's something that John and I, John, my brother-in-law, John Wesley, it's something that we worked on for a year or so, where he would ask me questions and I'd rattle off an answer. And uh, we, began, we began to be very fond of this endeavor. And uh, we, it grew in our minds as an, a vehicle go out and uh, try to ratchet up political awareness in communities around the country. And we did, uh, we did about 10 or 15 uh, sessions. And he would ask me a question, and I would give my answer to it. And since no one argued with us, it became important. Well, I understand that you're 